Well, uh, thank you very much for the kind words and for the introduction. Yes, I'm Brazilian, I look Dutch, I know. Uh, my parents are Dutch, so they immigrants to Brazil in the 50s, and um, I was born and raised on the farm, and uh, nowadays I still run uh, our family farm in Brazil, besides uh, my travel schedule. So um, uh, I hope that uh, today uh, we can go through some of the key issues uh, of agriculture, the future of agriculture. Um, I um, usually get questions at the end, but I understand that that's going to be a, um, a collective one. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that discussion. Um, what's actually the next GFC? I think that the next GFC we are going to face is the global food crisis, not the financial crisis. We sometimes forget that at the basis of our needs is actually food. And while the, we have a steep increase in the food demand, not actually much driven by the growth of the population by uh, 2 billion till 2050, but actually driven by the growth of income. The big question we have right now is how much meat we are going to eat. Needing to grow 60% more than what we grow right now or needing to double food production is going to be just a question of how much meat are we going to eat. If we all are going to consume as much as the Americans do, something like 120 kilograms of meat per capita, then we most probably will have to double production. Just to give you an idea, Chinese eat actually half of this, or at least around 60 kilos uh, meat per year. Would that grow a lot? Are the Chinese actually meat eaters? Big question, they are. Because if you look at Hong Kong Chinese, most probably the most Western Chinese we know right now, they consume already more than 80 kilos of pork every year. While the mainland Chinese, how we like to call them, they only consume 40 kilos. So if the Chinese would decide to double their intake of uh, pork, or at least meat, we will have a big issue. To be able to fulfill this demand, this growth of demand, we will have to grow production by at least 1.7 to 2% a year. So we will have to increase efficiency of our agricultural production between 1.7 and 2% a year. Can we do that? Can we do that? Is it also clear for all of us, and especially as the opportunity for Australia, that the big opportunity of growth income is in Asia? Even during the, then the financial GFC of 2008, 2009, the only region that continued to grow was Asia. That's the light blue color you see in front of you. 50% of all growth of income, being the growth of income, the most important part of food growth, of food growth consumption, is in Asia. It's very close to you. And as the minister said, your biggest opportunity. Why is that such a big opportunity? is because half of the world's population is actually residing more or less on 25% of all arable land. So where the growth is going to happen, where there will be a major growth of need for food, is a place, is a region where there is no arable land available anymore. What an opportunity. I uh, hope I had bought a farm actually in Australia. So, a lot is talk about Africa, but if you look at it, Africa actually doesn't have so much surplus of arable land towards what we think is going to be their population. If you look at, again, at USA, Canada, or maybe if I change that, uh, looking at, I will come back to this slide, on a different way, is that if you need more or less half a hectare per Westerner, how much hectares you have exceeding? 
So Australia being a big country with a small population actually has four times more land available per head, per head of, uh, of population to export. And if you look at that, Canada has surpluses, Argentina surpluses, United States just, but then you see actually all those other countries not having enough arable land for the future to actually feed themselves, and who knows, have excesses for export. Because all the things we're talking is that countries will first feed their own population and then have excesses for export. Huge opportunity. I will go back to this slide because I think it's a very much telling slide. In the past years, how did we actually cope with increasing demand? We actually got more land into production. That's the white, oh, sorry, that's the, the, the blue uh, um, line. You see from the 60s until more or less mid 2000s or beginning of the 2000s, start of the millennium, every time we actually had more demand for food, our population was growing, what we did, we just put more land into production. But actually, in the last, 20, uh, last 10 years, it reversed. We're actually losing land. We actually, urbanization is going faster. So the, all the, uh, the erosion, all the other issues affecting rural is actually getting the higher hand. And the amount of land we are, we are actually having in production like now is actually starting to decrease. First time. There's a game changer going on here. And where are we going to if it goes like this? Right now, we have more or less 0.7 hectares per head of population. And we are going to 0.5 hectares. Is that what we're going to? There will be an extrapolation? I don't know. Who knows? There's no much more land available anyhow. So something is right here. And if we also have an increase of, uh, of income, that's even putting more pressure. So the question remains, can we feed the world sustainably? So, the real thing is, is that the real issue for us is that if we want to feed the world more sustainably, we will actually look to have to look at the resources. Technology is there. We at, as community, as rural community, already know how to produce nine tons per hectare. So, yeah, per hectare. But the world is actually only producing two and a half to three tons per hectare. So it's not an issue of can we do it. It's actually an issue how we're going to deploy the resources. If you look at this, we know right now that we will have already now, we have a factor four we have to deal with until 2050. We have to double, almost double production, and we will only have half of the resources available to do so, and being the main resource, water. There is huge competition for water, especially for the urbanization of our cities. So if food is going to be successful, it will have to produce double with half of the water availability. And I didn't hear much about that today. Are we being more sustainable? Is rural being able to do it? Or how is, what's going to be the right answer to it? There is only one answer which is possible. And the answer is actually that we will have to intensify how we produce. If you look at this graph, it shows actually the production of milk out of one herd, one cow. And you see that the only way of meeting demand with less resources is actually to increase productivity. If you produce not enough a thousand liter per cow, which is more or less the average in the world, you're actually not being sustainable enough. So we all have to work very hard to increase, actually, the intensification of farming. And that's the only way forward. It's not the, the best that a lot of um, uh, uh, NGOs want to hear, but there's no other way around. The only other option for the world is nowadays then to produce less. But is that an option? Is that an option that we will have billions of people unless have a hunger? That's not an option. I don't think it's an option. And I would not be behind that option. So we will have to increase efficiency. We have been doing that. If you see in the last 60 years, and I'm, I'm using milk because that's, for Rabobank, one of the biggest assets we invest in. 
as, as financiers, is that if you look at the last 60 years, we have been able to actually, with 10% of the land, produce the same uh, amount of milk. We have been able to reduce the use of water. So it, the, the society, the rural society, is a very innovative society once you really put the restraints on them and really show where you have to go. But you need to give it time. The worst thing that can happen to rural and to the agriculture and to the prime industry is that you have to change in just one year. If you give the direction and you put the right pricing mechanisms, uh, farmers that are entrepreneurs will certainly go to the right way. If you look at what's happening with the agriculture, look what huge development. I, there are very few industries that have been able to increase so much the productivity per labor. While in the 1200s we used to put 600 man hours per hectare to produce not even a ton, we are already at the developed rural areas, especially also here in, in Australia, being able to produce nine tons with 12 hours of man input. And with the current development, with precision farming, with GPS, most probably we can get another 20% on top of that regarding productivity and most probably half uh, the use of uh, man hours. Huge uh, developments, but only possible because of the technology. But that's not enough. Because if you look at the long-term trends right now about increase of yielding, they're actually going down under historical averages. Rice, being one of the most important staples in the world, is actually going, uh, decreasing of the increase of productivity tremendously. Right now, we as society, although we are doing all our best, are being only able to increase productivity on an average of 1.4%. And the needed is actually above 1.75%. And this is all about investment. So I was very happy yesterday evening to see that innovation and new ideas were at the forefront of, of uh, the funding of the government. So I would like to commend uh, the, uh, the Australian government for that. Because the reality is that since the 70s, the amount of investment into research of productivity beyond the farm gate has not increased and actually decreased. I would like to go on with starting to go slowly to my ending remarks, uh, Chairman, is that, and this is maybe a difficult slide, but I would like to tell you, and a lot of people say that actually there are two factors which are the most important for productivity, and that's not true. The quality of soil and the quality of the climate are not correlated, as you can see, uh, with, uh, which is the light blue uh, graphs, with actually the output. The output of a society regarding rural is fully correlated to actually, actually the social enabling factors. So the way governments, the way infrastructure, the way the banks access to finance, uh, the way the laws are organized, are actually the most important factor for yields in the world. So I was very happy to hear today a question by one of you saying that how can we increase vitality of the communities? Because that's what it's all about. Can we get the best human resources out there into the field so that we can be successful rural entrepreneurs? So I would like to tell you that can we feed the world sustainably? Yes, we can. But it's not because we don't have, although we are decreasing the arable land, we still have a lot to gain on productivity. If you think that society today, the well-organized society, where all the enabling factors are present, can produce nine to 10 tons right now per hectare, and the societies that have not been able to create the enabling factors correctly are actually only producing between two and three tons. So only if we all together here would invest in Africa or invest in Latin America so that we get the enabling factors right, we actually could sustainably feed the world. What is Rabobank doing for this? We actually have a program called Banking for Food. And as you see here behind, everything is orange. Orange, the color of the Netherlands, obviously, are the countries we are right now uh, operating. We operate globally, and we only, almost only do it in the food and agri-space. We have the Rabo Foundation, 
The Rubble Foundation goes to the heart of the enabling factors. We spend between 10 and 20 million euros every year in creating cooperatives for poor farmers so that they can get out of um, subsistence and get into organized and cooperative so that they can start to think about commercially farming. Then we have Rabo Development, which is already operating in 16 countries. And what Rabo Development does is to try to create financial inclusion, a financial system in the countries where we operate so that people have access to finance. Example, in Tanzania, we already started there now in 2005. And by means of having a strong bank right now, we, can, we are able to open branches in rural areas. More importantly than opening the rural branches is that we can man the rural branches with account managers that can talk to farmers about how they can be successful. And then Rob International, as we operate here in Australia, amongst others, uh, we, um, uh, we support the rural uh, as, as one of our real passions. And I hope that you, some of your most probably customers of our here in Australia, hope that you know and you feel that we as Rabobank and our account managers and our whole organization think that we are, we are passionate about rural because we really think that's the way to the future. But our passion is actually also translating into a question. We brought 50 farmers of 18 countries to the Netherlands who had homestay with other 50 Dutch farmers. And we also make this question to them. If you want to double production and you have to feed the world, what are your constraints? What has to be changed? And today, I have not heard yet about the number one constraint of our farmers. It's about succession. Can I get the, sec the next generation? Can I inspire my kids? Can I make them attracted to the farming business? How can I actually pass on my enterprise to the next generation? Being that the number one question of those farmers that came to the Netherlands. I will not go in details of all of those questions because we have in the corner there some books, which is actually called The Future of Farming, which is the summary of all those uh, interactions we had one week. And we will continue those interactions in the Banking for Food strategy. We will have in June a Young Global Farmers uh, class in the Netherlands, where we are going to ask the farmers, the young farmers, what about succession? Then in August 2014, for the ones that, that are, uh, I want to participate, maybe we can talk about that, about a Global Farmers Masterclass here in Australia, followed by one in Africa, and who knows, pre in preparation to an F20 that should get just before the G20 here in Australia, where we want to give our input to the G20 regarding food security. And the themes we want to discuss during that, uh, that period are four mega trends, which we think are key for the global challenges. First is obviously the increase of food availability. How can we enable you, you farmers, a country like you, to produce more? The second key issue we will be asking to the, in these global classes is about how can we guarantee access to food? So you produce food, and how do you guarantee access to food? How can the supply chain be organized in such a way that waste is not there, the waste is reduced, and the food reaches where it has to reach on a sustainable way? The third one is actually talking about nutrition, something I've also not heard yet. More than a billion people eat too much, more than a billion people have not enough food. Do we eat right? Do we have a balanced nutrition? We produce enough calories, we just make a lot of sugar. It's not good enough. We have to have vegetables. How are we going to make sure that we give access of a balanced nutrition to the world? Big question for us, and we don't have the answer yet, so we want to engage society to discuss about this. What should we be producing in Africa what should we be producing in Latin America? And last and but not least, how can we do it on a stable way? We have seen big swings of prices and availability of food in the last years. Coming, how can we make sure that we can do it on a stable way? The worst thing that you can have is that one day you have a lot of food and the last two, next two days you don't have food. 
How can we make sure that we can guarantee stability? How can we be resilient? It's a big question, a big ask. I'm very happy that we can put those teams forward as Rabobank, as a global organization. I'm very happy that you as Australians are doing white paper, but always afraid of white papers when they think about the inside to the outside. So I hope that your white paper actually looks from the outside to the inside. How, what's actually happening in the outside world? What is actually that people want to eat and how they want to eat and how can you capture that advantage and then look inside how you can fulfill that demand? If you don't do it like that, in my view, you have the risk that you'll be a supplier of a commodity and somebody else is going away with the value add. So I hope also that next year here, when I come here, there is actually an innovation award also for the most innovative product that somebody wants to buy. Thank you.